So I want to say that uh, Ethan Bodnar, who's the owner of Plant Kind, designed this garden in Oakland with the owner, Amelia. Uh, and before I go into that, though, I want to say that this whole virtual tour thing was actually Ethan's idea. So in 2020, as the virus was approaching and I was watching with alarm and wondering what to do with the in-person tour and the year's worth of work that had gone into putting it together and finally decided that I should cancel it. And I sent out an email canceling the tour and Ethan, who I did not know, uh, responded and said, I'm so sorry you had to cancel the tour. That must be really hard and disappointing. Have you ever thought of holding a virtual tour? And I thought, that's ridiculous. Of course, I've never thought of holding a virtual tour. But then both of us, Ethan and I, saw the virtual tour that the Theodore Payne Foundation ran in Southern California. Uh, it was like just about a week and a half after I'd canceled our tour. And when I saw it, I thought, that's what I want to do. And I called Ethan, who I had never met, and said, would you help me? And he helped me. So for the next five weeks, we worked together. We spent so much time with Stephanie also and put on this like last minute seat of the pants, unexpected virtual tour. And we did so much work and I never even met Ethan until after it was well over. So I wanna say, Ethan, I bow to you across my computer screen. And so should everybody who was watching this presentation today. Thanks, Kathy. I'm so glad we were able to make it happen back then. And I it's still too. going strong today, which is great. A lot has come of it. All right, so uh, Ethan owns Plant Kind. He designed this garden in Oakland with the owner, Amelia. The goal was to create a welcoming space for their family to enjoy and for their toddler to explore. Not Ethan and Amelia's toddler, but Eth uh, Amelia and her husband's toddler, I should say. In this video, Ethan goes into the design considerations such as light and he features some of the plants they chose. And um, Ethan, is there anything that you'd like to say before we start the video? Uh, no, but just to kind of add on to your story there, this was, uh, so I, you know, I've been designing gardens before this uh, with some native plants, but this was, you know, after the tour ended and, you know, I met you and I saw Doug's talk. This was the very first garden where I was like, you know, all natives. Um, so this garden's kind of really a result of of what I learned on, on the tour back in 2020. Well, I'm so glad to have you as a convert. And I wanna say also that Ethan also rose to the challenge as a number of our hosts did this year and made this video himself. Like these people really worked so hard to, to learn how to use the software and you know create a storyline and put it all together. And it was a Herculean effort, I know. So thank you, Ethan, for making your video and let's go watch it now. I would say this sounds obvious, but I, uh, I always thought that people chose to have a native garden just because of water requirements, that they're sort of more environmentally friendly because they, um, their needs are sort of aligned with that of the climate we live in, which is pretty arid at this point. Um, I think I was less aware of the other benefit, which is that all of the, you know, native uh, birds and insects and animals um, are also going to harmonize better with those plants. And so that was um, something I learned that I think is pretty cool and, and a really great reason um, to plant native plants. And in terms of weeding and pruning, uh, we do prune you know, once or twice at the end of the summer, things were getting really, really um, long and lanky in some places. Um, so pruned that. 
And in terms of weeding, we've been in the process of getting rid of our oxalis weeds. Uh, we don't have a weed barrier in the raised back part of our garden. I would say the number one activity we get up to outside has to do with cooking and eating. We are a family that loves to cook together and when the weather is nice, I don't think there's much better than having um, an outdoor dinner together as a family. We do a lot of grilling and um, my daughter loves water play. She's um, still pretty young toddler, so she loves getting into the pool or the water table and splashing around. She loves the pea gravel we chose um, for the backyard in lieu of turf or grass. Um, has a lot of fun kind of putting the rocks into egg cartons or uh, into the pool itself. So that's that's been fun to watch. And then she's really into uh, smelling things. She's very interested in exploring her world through smells. The bird bath provides just a bit of water for the local birds and other critters, um, you know, a place for them to stop by and stay hydrated as they explore the garden. We used a smart outlet in the corner here uh, for the string lights, and this makes it so you don't have to climb through the salvia bush each time to turn on and off the lights. And it's important, you know, to keep your lights off uh, when you're not using the space so it doesn't impact migrating birds overhead. And because the lights attract the very moths uh, and butterflies that we are, you know, supporting with the garden uh, and, you know, just leads to exhaustion or burning them out over time as they're drawn to the lights. We all need a place to rest and somewhere to call home, especially our native solitary bees. And they're really important to help pollinate uh, the plants in the garden. And uh, so having a little bee house or a bee hotel is a great addition to your garden. We care for our garden uh, in a pretty low key way. So we in the summer months and the drier months try to water the garden about two or three times a week. Um, we don't really water it very much, which was part of the reason we wanted to do um, you know, mostly native plants. But um, in the wet months, we don't water it at all. Doug Ptolemy's work is really a cornerstone or the keystone to our understanding of native plants and seeing his talk on the garden tour a couple years ago is what led to me committing to only garden with native plants. In this book he writes, in other words, we're learning how to create landscapes that contribute to rather than degrade from local ecosystem function. The necessary task of restoring this ecological function to the land lies mostly before us. With the Sun Surveyor app, we're able to get a sense of the patterns of the sun, especially throughout the seasons. Uh, we can set it to different days in the year and see the trajectory that the sun takes over the garden. We can also see what time of day neighboring structures or the house or other trees might block out the sun to get a sense of what the future garden might be like. For here, we had the oak tree in the neighbor's yard as well as uh, the fence line in the house providing a bit of shade. And then on Calscape, we're able to see the light requirements of all of our native plants and get a sense of what will work well. Probably one of my most visited websites is our beloved Calscape resource that we have here. We're able to really get a sense of what plants exist in different ecosystems with the map view. Uh, we're trying to, you know, kind of honor and appropriate nature in some ways and what we would find out in the wild or in the East Bay Hills. So for here, this is the currents and we can see their size, um, their dormancy, 
you know, sun, moisture, summer irrigation is a great statistic as well as growth rate on the Calscape website. And also just making sure that they're, you know, commonly available in the nurseries and not something too funky. To get a sense of what the plants look like in the garden, we want to go to Google Photos since Calscape is more botanical in nature. And then we have our plant list generated that we'll use to source the plants. When we're designing a garden, it's really uh, putting a set of intentions in place for what it might look and feel like at some point in the future. And I love to co-design a space with the clients and kind of have them be active participants. And Amelia was great in this regard and she had some visions for the space and you know how they wanted to use it and kind of live outside and cohabitate with the native plants. We explored a range of different options, uh, potentially a native grassland, where to put the deck, uh, and ultimately ended up expanding this rock wall area and positioning the deck within the garden so you really get immersed within the space. So instead of just looking or viewing the garden from the patio area, we have this sort of multi-purpose deck platform where you're able to enter and be in the garden. Uh, and so you can see that they have a tent kind of play fort on there, which is really fun. Um, but at times, you know, you can have chairs or seating, uh, roll out a yoga mat, and just be more, you know, hanging out with the plants. We do a quick site model just to get a sense of how everything works together. And we're able to create a couple uh, new gardens. We have the crescent shaped garden by the grill there and another kind of corner nook garden up against the house. Uh, we kept it open so that there's plenty of room for running around in the pea gravel and also kind of moving the table or furniture in a sort of modular way so that the space can adapt over time. And then the garden really started to take form and come together. We have the pea gravel as a permeable surface, uh, so we're trying to stick away from concrete or you know, too much hardscaping that isn't natural. And finally, we have the plants on site, which is really exciting. We're able to kind of make some edits and uh, adjust spacing, think through how the plants are going to be situated in their final homes, uh, different groupings focused on odd numbers and different, uh, a couple plants are one off. So they're kind of more special focal points. Uh, that are a nice sculptural moment here and there. As much as you can plan a garden, it's a really special moment when you finally have the plants on site and you can get a sense of what the garden's gonna feel like. Uh, it's a really playful time just making any last minute edits or getting the positioning just right. This was a pretty exciting process because Amelia and her family were down to get their hands dirty and so they planted all the plants in the ground and got to have that connection with them and see how everybody was settling in. Uh, we missed the winter planting season, so this was installed in late April, but you can see it's still a, a bit of a rainy day. And at this point, I think they're all just excited to be in the ground and stretch out their legs and be outside of their, their one gallon pots that they've been in for so long. They love frosty green and kind of grays for the foliage, and so of course the salvias are a wonderful choice for this. It was fun to nestle this one in the corner here so it kind of grows up and fills in that space. It also mirrors uh, some of the lower ground cover salvias that we have in the rest of the garden. We also have the Mullenbergia origins, the deer grass. It's a bunch grass. Uh, it's pretty easy to grow. On other projects, we've used it for bank stabilization on hillsides, but here it's just a nice short grass uh, underneath the window, and you can see that it is flowering with these narrow pointed leaves. And of course, the California fuchsia, one of everybody's favorites, it's really spreading here through the rhizomes and kind of coming out of its winter dormancy. We've seen it spreading throughout the rest of the garden. Here we have the Bacchus pigeon point. Uh, this is the dwarf coyote bush. It's a really nice variety because it's on the shorter side, maybe two feet tall. 
and it's being used here as sort of an understory for a couple of the citrus trees in the garden. Um, it's fire resistant, which is nice and deer resistant if that is something you're thinking through. And then we've paired it with the California fescue, um, which you can see kind of has the purple shimmer with its flowers right now, which is pretty. Um, that's also deer resistant if that's something you're thinking about. The coyote bush is nice here as well because it kind of blurs the boundary of the edging with the garden and bleeds over onto the pea gravel, just softening uh, that that line there. And it supports a ton of wildlife, so it's a, a really positive addition to the garden. We see it a lot um, when we're out hiking these days, so it's nice to bring the plants that we see out in nature also into the garden. Same with the fescues, you know, you'd see those traditionally, um, well, as part of many plant communities, but especially around here in Oakland under oaks in the, the hills. These are the currants, and so they're a member of the gooseberry family, um, but these currants have no prickers, uh, which is ideal here, especially with kids running around. Uh, they're pretty drought tolerant and hardy. Um, we've been using them up against fences a lot lately also in our own garden. Uh, and they're just kind of fast growing, so they make a great impact in the garden quickly. Um, you would find them underneath oaks a lot, uh, and so we thought about that with the neighbor's oak tree. Uh, the berries are a great food source for the birds, so that's another kind of thing in the plus column for the currants. With the blue-eyed grass, you really get the best of both worlds because we have this grass-like uh, foliage texture along with the blue and purple flowers. They're flowering at this time of year, so late winter through spring, and then they'll kind of die back and get a bit funky as we move into the summer. The lilac verbenas are really a crowd pleaser, especially with the butterflies who love them. Here we're using them draping over the rock wall uh, and they're kind of you know a mounding plant uh, this variety and so they get to be about two to three feet tall and wide uh, they're always blooming for the most part you know more with the the warmer weathers in the spring and the summer but it's a steady constant in the garden outside of california and and where i grew up they were grown as annuals so for a new garden like this one they're really able to get things going and kind of kick off uh, the garden with a bang due to their fast growth rate. My favorite plants are the lilac verbena and the quail bush. I think one thing you learn when you plant a garden is not everything is going to like it where it's been planted and um, I think accepting that trial and error is part of gardening has helped me a lot. We have the creeping sage as a kind of ground cover salvia. Um, this is used here to drape over the walls and kind of blur that boundary, uh, just to soften the stone work a little bit. They're full sun, so they're, you know, for the most part, they can do a little bit of light shade inland, which we get with uh, some dappled shade with the oak. And they're just super steady grower, very resilient, uh, they can kind of have a bit of a wild side and they have this dense matting uh, sort of growth habitat. The Arctostophilus emerald carpet is off to a pretty slow start here, but slow and steady, uh, which is common for a lot of our Montanitas. And they really like well-draining soil. Um, so in nature, we would find the Montanitas on a hillside. Um, this one is up against the edge of the rock wall, which is partly for that reason, for some good drainage, and then also aesthetically so that with time uh, over the years to come, it'll grow and drape over. We have a handful of them here in this garden. They can do uh, well together in large groupings to kind of cover a large area, uh, especially if it's on a little hillside that you're trying to cover with some greenery and they do well with some part shade, especially inland here. 
The huckleberries are a great addition to the garden. We have them in a bit of shade here and they provide a bit of that red foliage color uh, which occurs with the new growth and it's, you know that's not something we find a ton so it's nice to have that element and that aesthetic available as as part of the planting palette and they're a great fruiting food source uh, for wildlife these are off to a bit of a slow start the first year but seem to be picking up pace now so excited to see what they do in the years to come we have our California wild rose in the background here as a foundation plant, just kind of for fun and a one-off uh, experiment. It's deciduous, so it's not always with us, but it's a great addition to the garden. And we have the fragrant pitcher sage, which the flowers are a really nice nectar source for the hummingbirds and the bees. They get a bit top heavy, um, so we've been cutting them back a little bit to help them to regrow. but. They're kind of fun in how they drape uh, and intersect with other plants in the garden. We see a lot of hummingbirds in our backyard, which we love. I don't remember ever seeing quite so many, um, especially in the springtime. It's really, really fun. Um, you almost kind of get used to it, but it's very special. I'm not so great with bird names, but I can say we have tons and tons of birds. And when you're outside, sometimes it seems like it's like a fake um, meditation soundtrack, which is like beautiful birds chirping. We have a huge oak tree next door to us that we're lucky to enjoy, but not have to take care of. I think adds to that's like a really nice oasis for all of the local birds. The alfalfa looper moth, the billow bed looper moth, the black banded carpet, the carpent worm moth, the clover looper moth, Clark's day sphinx moth, the common euphalepica, the common ringlet, the coyote brush borer moth, the coyote brush gall moth, the double banded carpet, the fall cankerworth moth, the fall web worm, the forest tent caterpillar, the gab's checker spot, the ellipsin dart, the Lindsay skipper, the orange tautric moth, the sandhill skipper, the sulfur moth, the white line sphinx. All may at current or at one time live here in this backyard hosted by these native plants, making them the key foundation of our local ecosystem. And there wasn't much garden to speak of when we started out. It was just, you know, mostly dirt. And um, I, I sort of impulsively initiated this project during the pandemic when, um, you know, we were at home all the time and uh, having a viable and delightful outdoor space was a huge privilege and something that I think all of us appreciate uh, even more now than we did before. So I'm very happy with our decision to make it a really nice place to hang out. I think it's really important and I'm very, very glad we made that investment. Who planted this oak tree, and what was their vision then? What are the long-term effects of growing up as a toddler surrounded by native plants? What happens when all the neighbors start planting native gardens too? What types of interconnected wildlife habitats can we imagine? How many birds' lives will your garden touch over the next decade? What do you think this garden will feel like in the future? Well, Ethan, that was just terrific. Thank you so much. Thank you. So let's see, <clears throat> when was this garden installed? Yeah, it would have been installed um, roughly. That's the fall, yeah, the fall or late winter of uh, 2021. Yeah, I guess early 2021. So it's, so it's had a couple, it's gone through a couple seasons. It'd be like a year and a quarter old then, is that right? Yeah. It's yeah. fantastic for a new garden, isn't it? Yeah, it's really grown in quick. Um, 
which is always, you know, always surprising and people are kind of concerned, you know, when they're that blank slate, how, how quickly things are going to happen. So. Yeah, it looks great. So, uh, and you took a uh, great advantage of that magnificent oak that's in the neighbor's yard. Yeah, that was quite the blessing to have, have the oak there. Um, and they had done, they did a bit of tree work uh, on it before we installed the garden, just so there weren't any kind of falling branches on our, our, our one gallon uh, plants. That's good. And then there's no irrigation irrigation system installed in this garden. They hand water, is that right? Yeah, yeah, they hand water. And, you know, that was kind of a conversation we had um, with, with Amelia when we were designing the garden. And, you know, it kind of just becomes more of a cost thing as you save a couple thousand dollars by doing that. But then also just, you know, you can hang out with the plants. And uh, there's always that common question of like, you know, how long is it going to take to water a garden? And... Uh, you know, they have a smallish backyard, uh, so it's, you know, a cup of coffee and a little podcast and you're, you're good to go. Um, so. I love that you talk about the dark skies at night. So that was something that Ethan and I both heard about from Doug Tallamy is the importance of turning off your exterior lights at night, using motion sensors instead of leaving lights on all night long. And then there are these lights that you can purchase that are certified by the Dark Skies at Night group. And you can get them from Home Depot. And the thinking behind Dark Skies at Night is that migrating birds get thrown off course by all of our city lights and moths batter themselves to death on our exterior lights. So we bought Dark Skies at Night's approved lights. And it just means they have a cap across the top that keeps the light pointing down and not shining up. So thank you for mentioning that in this talk. <clears throat> for sure, yeah. Yeah, it's really, yeah, really important to try and, you know, even a couple of clients uh, recently have like brought that up themselves. So I think the word is, is getting out there. Mm -hmm. um, one resource I'd like to mention is the Las Politas website. I often go to Las Politas for information about plants and good photographs and growing information. And I know you use Calscape to help you pull your plant list together. Yeah, yeah, Calscape is, um, it really has like data that I like to see and just able to kind of skim it and see everything, the hierarchy and how it works together. But um, yeah, Las Politas and uh, the Cal Flora Nurseries website kind of, uh, their descriptions are a bit more painterly and kind of get into more of, yeah, some other sides of the plants as well that Calscape doesn't uh, get across. Yeah, and I loved your, um local moth roll call that you had. <laughs> that was really fun. And I guess, I'm guessing that you might have found that information on Calscape. Is that right? Yeah, that was all all in Calscape. So I basically had the list of plants for this garden. And then you can see which moths uh, and butterflies that they support. Um, yep. Yeah. And you could also use Calscape in reverse. So once you find a moth or a butterfly that you're particularly mm -hmm. interested, you can see what plants it needs. So that's a nice way to be able to look both ways at what your garden will provide and then thinking like, what do you wanna do for uh, local lepidopterans? Uh, if you'd like to see, read more about this garden, you can look at the um, <clears throat> online, uh, sorry, you can look at the list of uh, view these gardens is where it is um, on the 2022 tour. But this is one's a little tricky. This is uh, the only garden I think that's up there that you actually cannot visit this year. Uh, but you can read about it and you can find the plant list there. If you'd like to uh, contact Ethan, you can look under find a designer on the website, uh, the Bringing Back the Natives Garden Tour website, and you'll find him under plant kind. Um, and your, your website is plantkind.co. Am I right remembering that? Yes, yeah, dot co or dot earth if you want to have a little fun with the, yeah, the dot com was taken. So yeah, just in Google. Well, that was a lovely oh, garden. You did a great job with the video and it was just so nice to see what you've produced, Ethan, and uh, hope to have more of your gardens on the tour in the future. Yeah, already scheming for, for next year. So great. yeah, it was really fun to put that, that story together and thanks for sharing it. Sure, and thank you again for making that video. It was fun. The Watershed Nursery, which is located in Point Richmond. Owners Laura Hansen and Diana Benner and their team grow hundreds of species of California native plants. The Watershed Nursery is open Tuesday through Sunday from 10 to 4. 
You can shop in person in their large outdoor nursery, or you can place an order for curbside pickup. You can reach them at thewatershednursery.com. And let's hear a brief word from owner Diana Benner. Greetings from the Watershed Nursery, a native plant nursery in Richmond, California. We have been providing healthy native plant material for local habitat restoration projects and private gardens for over 20 years. We specialize in source identified plants grown 100% in house using the top best management practices. With new species hitting our shelves every week, we have an abundance of plants to choose from. We hope you come visit us soon. I'd like to thank uh, our stalwart major funders, the Alameda County Flood Control and Water Conservation District, the Contra Costa Clean Water Program, the Contra Costa Water District, and the Clean Water Program Alameda County for their continued belief in this program and the funding that makes this tour possible. I'd like to thank the other sponsors for their support for this year's tour. and these sponsors as well. Garden tour hosts Ann Chambers and Ed McAlpin have generously offered a $500 challenge grant. If these funds can be matched with donations from viewers. If you haven't yet had the chance to contribute, please help by making a donation now. You can do so via the donations button on the tour's homepage at Bringing Back the Natives. You'll see it at the bottom through Venmo at Bringing Back the Natives, on the tour's GoFundMe page, or you can mail in a check. The tour's address is under Contact Us. <laughs>